Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, the Marketing Segment Manager at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. It's entitled Primary Airway Cells and 3D Models, Optimizing Culture at the Air Liquid Interface, and is presented by Dr. Kevin Tayo. Dr. Tayo is a scientist at ATCC. In this presentation, Dr. Tayo will elucidate techniques and procedures that can help you reliably generate 3D airway models with consistent full epithelial differentiation. After the presentation, join us for a lively discussion as our R&D scientist answers your questions. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Tayo. Thank you, Brian, for that kind introduction. Good day, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Kevin Tayo, a scientist at ATCC, and I would like to talk a little bit about fabricating 3D airway models. But before I start, I'd like to say a couple of words about ATCC. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization headquartered in Manassas, Virginia, with an R&D and service center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We are an innovative company that possesses the world's largest biological materials and information resources for cell culture. We serve as a global supplier of authenticated cell lines, including cells used to fabricate 3D airway models. In this presentation, I want to provide an overview of the methods used to generate 3D airway models that have appropriate model morphology and epithelial differentiation. Here, we will investigate potential differences in airway models comprised of either primary human bronchial tracheal epithelial cells, or HPECs, to HTERT immortalized cell lines. We will also look into lot to lot variation between different primary cell lots. We will also discuss how your choice of differentiation media can greatly affect model maturation and morphology. Finally, we also want to compare airway models generated from cells from either ATCC or other suppliers. Throughout this talk, we will also review common pitfalls in airway model fabrication. When we talk about airway models, we are referring to recapitulating a portion of the human respiratory tract. The respiratory tract is comprised of different regions. The upper respiratory tract, which includes the nasal cavity and pharynx. The lower respiratory tract contain the bronchial tracheal tract and small airways. And finally, the distal tract, which refers to the alveoli. Each of these regions consists of specialized cells, each having specific functions and facilitating air exchange. For our purposes today, we will be talking exclusively on models mimicking the bronchial tracheal tract using primary bronchial epithelial cells. Here, we will talk about how to properly induce differentiation to produce a mature airway model containing basal, goblet, and silated cells. I do want to mention that whatever region of the human respiratory tract your research focuses on, ATCC provides a wide array of primary cells to choose from. We have a variety of healthy cell lots available from different donors. Moreover, we can also provide disease airway cells as well, such as asthma, COPD, fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis. In addition, ATCC offers HTERT immortalized cells derived from either the bronchial tracheal tract or small airways. We take pride in our ability to offer you a wide array of cells to support your research. As I mentioned earlier, 
This talk is primarily focused on creating 3D array models comprised of primary HBECs. Here, we conducted a series of studies to investigate different parameters that can affect the maturation of these 3D models, as well as cause replicate variability. In our first set of studies, we wanted to investigate the role of media choice in affecting bronchial epithelial differentiation. Here, we tested four separate lots of primary bronchial epithelial cells and culture them with four different medias, complete bronchial growth media, an 80-20 mixture of complete bronchial and fibroblast growth medias, as well as ALI differentiation medias offered by either lifeline cell technology or stem cell technologies. In addition, we also investigated the usage of HTERT immortalized cell line newly won in creating ARI models. Moreover, we also wanted to investigate how the plate layout can affect replicate variability by either using all wells within a 24 well plate or just the interior wells only. Here, empty wells from these partial plates are filled with two mils of Dubelco's phosphate buffered saline or PBS. During these studies, weekly tear measurements and apical washings were conducted two weeks following ALI, which I'll speak more on the next slide. This slide provides an overview of the airway model fabrication process, which takes about five to six weeks to perform. This is why it's so important to cover all the different variables. First, we'll add a transwell inserts into our selected wells within a 24 row plate. Again, either using all of the wells or just the interior wells only. We then apically coat the transwell inserts with a 100 microliters of 0.3 mg per mil collagen solution and incubate the plates overnight at four degrees Celsius. Afterwards, we'll place the plates back into a biosafety cabinet and allow them to reach room temperature. We'll then wash the, the membranes uh, twice using PBS. We will then seed the bronchial epithelial cells at 100,000 cells per well at volumes of 200 microliters. And then we'll add 0.5 mils of complete bronchial growth media to the basal side. We'll then incubate the cells for 48 to 72 hours to ensure complete cell confluency on the apical membrane of these transwell inserts. Once they're fully confluent, we'll remove the apical media, partially exposing the cells to air, hence air-liquid interface or ALI. We will also replace the basal media with our appropriate differentiation media. We'll then culture our cells for an additional four weeks under ALI conditions to ensure epithelial differentiation, replacing the basal media every other day. A few more notes on this. After two weeks of ALI incubation, we will perform weekly rinses on the apical side of the membrane to gently wash away any mucin produced, while being careful not to disturb the cell layer. This is important because excess mucin can affect model maturation, as well as affect transmembrane testing. We also perform weekly tear measurements, which I'll cover more in detail later. First, I want to talk about what these models look like during the air liquid interface culturing process. Here are some representative microscopy images taken right before ALI incubation shown in image A, as well as one week after ALI shown in B. At both time points, there is no discernible differences in cell morphology between cell lots, differentiation media, or even HTERC controls, which was expected because no differentiation has taken place. However, after two weeks of ALI incubation, the cell morphology began to change depending upon the choice of media. Here, we have representative images of cells incubated under ALI conditions for two weeks in either A, complete bronchial growth media, B, the 80-20 bronchial fibroblast mixture media, C, lifeline cell technology, and D, stem cell technology ALI medias. These differences became more pronounced as the ALI period progressed. Here, 
we ha we show representative images of cells after five weeks of ALI incubation in different medias. It's important to note that these morphological differences were only observed in models incubated in the different medias. When grown in the same media, different primary cell lots share similar model morphology, as shown here in these representative images of the four different ATCC primary cell lots incubated in stem cell technologies ALI media. Another note in our microscopy imaging was that our newly won HTERC control cells exhibited morphologies far different from our primary cell lots. Specifically, these models were much darker, indicating the formation of multilayers. After the ALI culturing period concludes, you should be left with mature ARI models comprised of fully differentiated bronchial epithelial cells, possessing goblet, silated, and basal cells. One of the ways you can test your model is to conduct tight junction studies. Two widely used methods are conducting tear measurements, as well as assessing dextran transmembrane diffusion. TIR, which stands for transepithelial, transendothelial electrical resistivity, measures the electrical resistance by passing a charge between two points on a chopstick probe of an ohmmeter. The higher the resistivity, the higher the tight junction of the ARI model. Another method to determine tight junctions, which we will show later in the talk, is to assess the transmembrane kinetics of a fluorescently labeled dextran. Here, we'll add the fluorescently labeled dextran to the apical side of the model and test how long it takes for the dextran to pass through into the basal media within a given time period. The greater the movement of dextran through an ARI model into the basal media, the lower the relative model tight junction. Thus, increased dextran transmembrane movement is inversely proportional to tear values. Another important note is that previous studies have shown that ARI models can possess high tear variance. If you take into account the surface area, tear values of bronchial cells can range from 400 to 4,000 ohms times centimeters squared. Although realistically, mature area models typically range from 400 to 1200 ohms times centimeter squared. This variability can be caused by a variety of different factors, including donor variability and media. What's important here is to not be alarmed if your primary cells don't share the exact same tier value shown here. As long as your area models have tier values above 400, you should be okay. So with that background out of the way, here is our tiered data from ARI models after five weeks of ALI culturing. This is a busy graph, but we can break it down. Here, we're looking at the total resistivity of four different lots of ATCC primary cells and our HTERP newly won controls, cultured in different medias shown on the x-axis. As we can see, media choice plays a major role in affecting the tier values with complete bronchial media demonstrating suboptimal resistivity relative to the other medias. Moreover, donor lot variability is present in all media groups. However, in all cases, models comprised of our newly won controls exhibit much lower resistivity relative to primary cell counterparts. This graph here shows the percent error of ARI models grown in either full 24 row plates or in our interior walls only, our partial plates. Here, we compare two different primary cell lots incubated in either stem cell or lifeline ALI medias. As we can see, fabricating models within the interior walls only results in a significantly decreased replicate variability relative to the usage of full plates. This is due to the partial plates limiting the edge effect where we observe increased evaporation and temperature differences in the outer wells of plates. Following our tier studies, we wanted to observe mature model morphology. To do this, we performed histological assessments of cross sections of preserved area models. Afterwards, these sections are either H&E or Alcian blue stained to observe silated or goblet cells respectively. Here, 
we will show Alshin Blue stained images of our models. Here are representative Alshin Blue stained histological images of area models incubated with various differentiation medias, with image A showing area models incubated in complete bronchial growth media, figure B showing models grown in 80-20 bronchial fibroblast mixture media, and C and D incubated in either lifeline cell technology or stem cell technology media respectively. Here, we see proper airy model formation in both lifeline and stem cell media due to the presence of both goblet and sided cells in these images. In addition, we also examined our HTERC controls. We see airy models comprised of newly won cells incubated in either lifeline media, shown in A, or stem cell media, shown in B. Although goblet cell formation was observed in models incubated in stem cell media, neither model exhibited proper model morphology. Following our first set of studies, we wanted to further investigate the fabrication process of bronchial airy models. Specifically, we wanted to compare airy models comprised of primary HBECs from either ATCC or from other suppliers. Here, models were generated using the optimized processes derived from the first set of studies, with models incubated in either stem cell media or their respective supplier differentiation media. When possible, we assess two lots from each supplier in addition to assessing three primary cell lots from ATCC. Here, we compare the tier values from airy models comprised of primary bronchial epithelial cells from either ATCC or other vendors incubated in either A, stem cell technology media, or B, their respective supplier ALI differentiation media. Although differences between lots and media choice was present, resistivity values for all models were acceptable. The only exception was lot one from supplier one, which showed low tier values both in stem cell technology media and the respective supplier differentiation media, indicating that the suboptimal tight junction and model formation for this specific lot. Next, we show the results from our fluorescently labeled dextran transmembrane diffusion analysis on selected area models incubated in either stem cell technologies media or other supplier ALI media. Again, tight junctions in models can be evaluated by comparing the rate of transmembrane diffusion of the fluorescent labeled dextran into the basal media. Here, we say that the rate of dextran diffusion was inversely proportional to the tier values and that decreased dextran basal concentrations were relative to increased model tier values and model tight junction. Mucin production here, in this case, muce 5 ac which is an indicator of epithelial differentiation, was also evaluated in selected airway models. Here, apical washes from airway models were collected and tested for mucin via ELISA. This graph shows that despite the presence of lot to lot variation, as well as media choice affecting mucin concentrations, all tested airway models were able to produce mucin. Here, we show additional Alshin blue stained images of area models comprised of three different ATCC primary cell lots incubated in either stem cell technology media, shown in figures A through C, or a lifeline cell technology media, shown in figures D through F. As we can see, all area models demonstrated acceptable model integrity with appropriate epithelial differentiation, showing the presence of both goblet and sided cells. Moreover, Little to no, no lot to lot differences were present between models. However, every models incubated in stem cell media did show increased model thickness. Finally, we also performed histological analysis on every models generated from other supplier primary cells. Here, we see representative images of every models from two primary cell lots from supplier A, shown in figure. A and B respectively, two lots from supplier B shown in figure C and D, as well as one lot from supplier C shown in E. 
With the exception of one lot from supplier A, all airway models demonstrated acceptable model integrity with appropriate epithelial differentiation showing the presence of both goblet and silated cells. Moreover, little to no lot to lot differences were present between models. In summary, airway models comprised of either ATCC or supplier cell lines were successfully generated. Differences between primary cell lots were present. However, media choice plays a much larger role in model maturation. Both commercial differentiation medias from stem cell technologies and lifeline cell technologies provided the best levels of epithelial differentiation. Replicate variability was minimized using our partial plates with PBS in the outer wells. Despite the presence of goblet cells using the stem cell technologies ALI maintenance media, HTERT newly won cells are not an appropriate substitute for primary bronchial epithelial cells in airway model fabrication. These results demonstrate that ATCC primary HPECs are an effective tool to generate airway models with appropriate epithelial differentiation, model morphology, and mature functionality for use in your research. This concludes my presentation. Thank you again for your time. I sincerely hope that this presentation was useful to you and your research. Again, we are here to support your research endeavors. If anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to ask. Brian or I will do our very best to answer them. Thank you again. Oh, well, thank you, Kevin. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. Uh, the recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. So we've got, already had quite a few questions come in, so let's go ahead and jump in. So Kevin, uh, why did you use 0 0.3 mg per mil collagen concentration before seeding the cells? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we wanted to add a collagen solution to sort of mimic the extracellular matrix to uh, make the cells more comfortable and help to induce differentiation. Now, the actual concentration that we use, if you look at literature, uh, you'll see a range uh, that goes from point th uh, 03 to 0 0.3 mg per mil range. We chose this concentration to ensure that the collagen, you know, fully coats the insert. And if there's any excess collagen, that would be removed um, when we would wash them during the, when we wash with PPS. Uh, and this, this washing step, of course, is conducted right before uh, seeding of the epithelial cells. All right, good, good. And um, can you follow up by explaining why you chose 100,000 cells um, for the cell seeding? Yes, so that's a, that's a good question. So uh, scientific literature has also shown that the density of the cells that you see are also very important. So for this particular size of the insert, uh, we see though that uh, we, we feel in our previous, based upon our previous work as well, that 100,000 cells are going to be, is a good uh, starting range. And that is if you were to use a lower n a number, it's going to, that would result in taking longer for the cells to reach full confluency. However, if you use too high of initial cell seeding, so let's say, for example, W amount, uh, uh, 200,000 cells, uh, that will actually affect the morphology of the airway model as it progresses, and it will be a suboptimal uh, morphology. Uh, so, you, so again, based upon our work, though, we do recommend uh, to seed, you know, with these uh, size inserts, um, a 100,000 cells per well. Okay, so that's the sweet spot then. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, now, could you talk about what caused the morphological differences in models um, with different medias? Or, or maybe another way of putting this would be, what was the rationale for using the different medias? What makes them different? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, the differentiation media and growth media 
Uh, as the name suggests, they have different applications. So just for clarification, uh, if you were to, um, you, you have to expose these cells to air because hypoxia is one of the things that will kind of, that will help, uh, uh, inhibit differentiation. Uh, growth media uh, helps to induce cell growth, uh, but they'll have components in it that will also inhibit uh, differentiation. So an example of this would be like the epithelial growth factors. Uh, in contrast, differentiation media either removes that or has it in a much reduced concentration. Um, but they'll also have other components that, uh, such as like uh, retinoic acid that will uh, induce differentiation. So just, just for summa summary here, differentiation media uh, has components in them and removes components uh, all to uh, promote differentiation, whereas growth media has components uh, that uh, actually inhibit differentiation, which is what you know, which is in line with what we've seen. Okay, good, good. Now, um, uh, this is actually a question that I've asked myself before. Um, would you expect the same results that you saw um, using the newly won cells um, if you tried using the HBEC 3 kt h more live cells? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, we, in fact, we would expect to see the same um, results. We had done some previous studies testing both of these H chert cells, and unfortunately, they're unable. Neither of them are able to form area models with the appropriate morphology. They don't. Uh, they're unable to uh, to differentiate into uh, an appropriate um, a mature area uh, model. Okay, so just like kind of follow up then. Um... HTERT immortalized cells in general. Um, I mean, do you still feel like they have high value, or is this sort of like an isolated area where, you know, this didn't really work? No, that, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Granted, uh, you know, with the exception of, of of producing these area models, um, HTERT cells have a lot of uh, you know, usage in different applications. I mean, keep in mind, these are very similar, I mean, practically the same as to primary cells. So they do have that physiological relevance you know, much, much more than your uh, traditional immortalized cell lines. Um, but, you know, one of the great things about them is that they have that uh, unlimited proliferative uh, potential, right? So they're not limited as we see with primary cells. Um, it, it's just that for this particular case, they're unable to differentiate into a mature area model. That's all. But there's still there's still plenty of applications that you can use them on. Right, right. And and I mean I can kind of add to that too. Um, you know, we've been able to show that uh in epidermal 3D models that DH turn immortalized hair C T, for example, uh will form 3D like structures and um the H turt melanocytes, if, if you throw that into the mix, um, those those um, 3D sort of skin strata like are much more robust even, and and you can even see staining of melanin. Um, so so yeah, I guess it just didn't really work very well for for this one application, right? One 3D mm -hmm. application. So okay. Um, now, the next few questions that have come in um, are around uh, here, right? So um, the first one was around the variables that uh, affect tier values. Um, and, and maybe you could even comment a little bit about different media types. Oh, yeah. So uh, you, you want to know the different variables that can affect tier values? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's yeah. Okay, so uh, so in this talk, we, we did mention things like the edge effect, right? We also talked about media choice does play a little bit. Um, we've we've also talked about how the primary cell lot um, is also going to they'll have their own uh, individual tier values as well, uh, as well as of course the usage of primary versus H chert cells. So again, we've talked about that in this talk, uh, but other factors that you know, may not be as, as noticeable or things like temperature. Temperature will greatly affect it. Uh, and so one thing that's very important is to ensure that the uh, plate is cooled to room temperature or you take it out the incubator, it's going to be kind of, um, there is going to be a different a difference of temperature. Typically the interior, interior part of the plate 
is going to have a, a higher temperature than the outside, right? So you want to let it cool down for about 30 minutes. Um, another thing that can affect it is that we use an EVOM to um, ohm meter, and we have to ensure that the instrument itself is warmed up as well as disconnected from an outlet. So the manual suggests that you want to let the instrument warm up for about 30 minutes to get it you know, um, normalized. And if you have it connected to an outlet, that will actually produce noise that will affect your signaling. So it actually becomes very difficult to get a stable uh, signal, in fact, if it's plugged in. So you want to make sure that it's unplugged as you're performing the readings. Um, another thing that's very important that people uh, have trouble with is that you want to make sure that, that when you hold the probe and use the probe, that you want to make sure that the position is consistent. Depending upon the angle of this probe, uh, it can affect the readings. So, you know, usually I try to do it as a top down, um, you know, straight straight down, uh, you know, add the two probes into the in both the basal and apical side. Um, but I try to maintain consistency between each um, wells because, again, that angle will greatly affect, um, you know, the, the overall readings. Uh, another thing, though, too, is that the volume of media used, the size of the plate well, uh, so you don't want to use six-well plates. Uh, the area is too large to get a uniform current, so something like 12-well, 24-well plates, and I think if you can fit it into a 48-well plate, that should be fine as well. Um, but, uh, again, you want to keep in mind that there's all these different variables that can affect it, and, and just, just keep that in mind. It's, it's like pH measuring, right? It's sort of deceptively... Simple, but there's all these little caveats to actually, you know, properly using this type of instrument. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that's great. You actually covered a couple of questions um, with that explanation, but um, the one um, though that that you didn't catch was um, how is tear calculated? Yes. Um, so what we do is that we we you know. We collect the tier values. These are raw tier values, and we blank subtract them. So we have uh, inserts that don't have cells. Uh, they're collagen coated. You know, they went to the same process, uh, but we, they have. You know, it's just they have media on top and, and beneath them, and we'll subtract the blank from the raw values. Those raw values are then multiplied by the area of the insert. Uh, so if you look at the data, that's why it's called. That's, that's why the on the y-axis it's showing ohms, which is resistivity times cm squared, which is referring to the area of the insert. And that takes account uh, the uh, difference in uh, an area of, let's say, if you're going to use a 12-wall plate versus like a 24-wall plate, that will take that into account. All right. Good, good. Now, can you change the size of dextrin in your tight junction study? Uh, yes, uh, you know you can alter the size so that you can use different sizes than we've done with the uh, fluorescent labeled dextran. Um, we recommend using either the same size or even smaller. Uh, and so, just to be clear, if you have a large uh, dextran, uh, it's going to take longer for it to cross the membrane. So you're going to see decreased rates of transmembrane movement. So you get similar results. You'll just have to wait a little bit longer. Whereas smaller dextran sizes uh, will, uh, you know, they'll Increase the rate of, of transmembrane diffusion, so you know you will see uh, results in, in um, much much quicker. Okay, good, good. Now, um, okay, uh, the next couple of questions that have come in are around passage number. So, um, first of all, what's the passage number of the cells when you seeded them onto the membrane, and does the passage number actually matter? Uh, yes. So uh, for for primary cells, it matters. Uh, for H tert cells, not doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, so for just to keep everything consistent, uh, we seeded uh, the cells uh, into the inserts following the second passage. Um, and the reason why this matters is that, so literature has shown that if you were to uh, seed primary cells uh, after they've been passaged four times, uh, they are often unable to um, create uh, area models that, uh, with appropriate morphology. Um, so you know, because of that, you want to uh, seed primary cells that have, you know, again, passages between two or three. 
no, but no more than that. And that should um, that that should ensure that again, if you take in all the other steps, that will ensure um, area models again. This you'll get a, a mature area model with this appropriate morphology. Okay, good, good. Um, now, uh, why did you use stem cell media but not the lifeline media in the second set of studies that you performed? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. So, uh, just to reiterate here, you know, in our first set of studies, we tested both the stem cell and lifeline differentiation medias, and both of them were able to induce differentiation. Um, and you know, we were able to get these mature area models. But you know, obviously, we we noticed that the um, the pneumocold ALI media from stem cell technologies produced the best results. So, in the second set of studies, just to kind of keep things you know, uh, you know, cut down the number of variables that we had to work with, we decided just to move forward with the stem cell media. Again, we wanted to see, okay, this is the best media. Um, let's go ahead and see how this works with the other uh, primary cell lines. All right. And do you feel that um, <clears throat> this method of culturing would work for disease models? I guess that would be like primary cells that were derived from diseased tissue. Yes, uh, so I think that, that that can be used, but your mileage may vary. Um, so there's going to be some difficulties in translating this protocol to every type of disease. Um, so I do know for a fact that that uh, you know literature has shown that you can use this this uh, protocol uh, to create area models uh, from taken from cells from um, asthma donors. Um, but you know, for other type of diseases, though, you, you probably have to do a few adjusting here and there to get it to work. But definitely, yeah, it's it's certainly doable. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now the the next sort of couple questions seem to be around applications in general. So, um, could this method be used to create cold culture models? And and one example that came in specifically was, could you add macrophages, um, and then look at like you know. I guess infection of pathogens like COVID-19 or um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, or a series of questions. So, I'll, I'll break it down into two things. Right? Can you do cold culture modeling, and also what are the applications? So, for the cold culture, um, yes, you can modify this method to include other cell lines. So, for example, you can take lung fibroblasts and you would add them into a collagen matrix uh, prior to the epithelial cell seeding or cell seeding, and that's been done. Um, and uh, then another thing you could do is you can also add lung endothelial cells and see them on the bottom side of the insert uh, prior to the epithelial cell seeding. Um, now, in regards to applications, yes, uh, if you were to um, you know, if you just use the epithelial cells alone, you can, you know, maybe start testing out, uh, you know, toxicology testing, right? Uh, expose these um, these cells to uh, compounds of interest. Uh, disease modeling can also be conducted again, as you you can incorporate things like um, uh, not just fibroblasts but also uh, dendritic cells, macrophages. That that has been done in literature again with some few modifications of the seeding process. Um, but that can be used to, you know, assess, um, you know, disease progression. So essentially, you know, as you, uh, you know, introduce uh, either a virus or bacteria, um, you know, a very common thing is to assess changes in cytokine um, concentrations based upon, you know, the progression of the disease. Uh, so it's not, you know, you can also do things like tier uh, measurements but, uh, and viability changes, but there's other things, though, too, including, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, cytokine measurements. So yes, there's there's tons of applications that you can use for these uh, models. Nice, nice. Okay, now um, to sort of switch gears a little bit, um, this next question is about how um, you conducted the histology study. Um, specifically, they want to know if, um, I guess when you slapped it on the microtome, um, did you, cut it together, the, the tissue, um, with the trans well, or did you peel it off the trans well? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, let me let me make sure I get my terminology right. Uh, so it's it's been a while, but what we do is is that once the model is fully mature, um, we will uh, preserve uh, these cells and actually to uh, image them. Uh, these um, they're parafilm embedded. Oh, excuse me. We will actually cut the bottom of the transole insert. Uh, so these preserved cells, and we have to do it very carefully, uh, we cut the bottom of the transal insert to remove the membrane, so we just get this membrane. Uh, we're parafilm embedded, and then we'll section it. And at those individual sections, uh, we, will, we will image those. Does that, I hope that answers that question. But yes, it's, we do actually have to cut uh, the bottom part of the, of the membrane. Be very careful about that. No, I think that that does answer the question, Kevin. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so for this next question, um, can you do the same tight junction type studies using white blood cells? And I think it's important to keep in mind that most white blood cells are, are cultured in suspension culture. Correct. So this, this probably wouldn't be appropriate for that because, you know, the tight junctions only you can only you know see differences if you have this sort of continuous uh, confluent layer. Uh, in fact, um, one of the issues in fabricating these models is that um, sometimes people will see that the model you know when you after you see the cells, you'll see the cells are confluent on the interior portion of the insert, but not on the edges. And that empty gap will essentially look like will be similar values of a blank. So if there's any openings of of or any sort of open spots on this cell layer, you won't really be able to see any differences to a tier measurement. And, and you're absolutely right, though. If you try to do tight junctions on a white blood cell, again, these are in suspension, you're not going to really see any difference, uh, you know, using this type of instrument. So this is only appropriate if, if to, to look at um, essentially a layer, a layer of cells, adherent layer of cells. Nice, nice. Okay, um, all right, so this next question is coming from my alma mater, actually. Um, what type of collagen did you use? Did you include things like laminin and fibronectin um, or other components of the basement membrane? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so uh, for, for this purpose, we just uh, purchased a commercial uh, product uh, so we didn't have to add anything. So it was just a, a just a, a simple solution that that uh, had everything we needed. Um, but the uh, the type of collagen, it's a type three bovine collagen uh, that was um, that was used. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. it's, it's type three and type one. Excuse me. Did you say that again? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was. It's both. It contains both uh, type. It's majority type one, but does have type three. Uh, uh, bovine collagen. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, um, have you just ever tried um, using A549 cells and trying to culture them um, in ALI and perform tier? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I uh, I have not personally, but from my understanding, they. Um, I guess you could do that though, but they they won't be able to produce like physiologically relevant like normal airway model. So I, I don't I don't necessarily think that would be um, I don't know off the top of my head uh, what the you know if, if you were to try to do you know tier values or or um, I don't know what they would look like, but I don't anticipate that you would be able to get if you let them undergo the ALI process. I don't think that they would actually, you know, differentiate. These are just, you know, you, you would still have the same morphology. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, uh, you mentioned that you need to warm up the EVOM for 30 minutes. How do you warm it up? Yes. That, uh, that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay, so warm up just basically means turn it on and leave it on. That's essentially it. So you turn it on, you know, you flip the switch and just let it run for 30 minutes. Um, 
and uh, you know you can unplug you know you can unplug it um, or remove it from an outlet. And there's a you know most of these EVOM instruments they will have like an internal battery pack to let it run for a couple of hours. Uh, but again, uh, we have it's important to let it warm up for about you know again uh, around 30 minutes, which is around the same time it takes for a plate to cool down to room temperature once you take it out from an incubator, uh, because it helps stabilize that signal. Uh, in fact, if you want to, you can actually check and see how much it changes, right? The freshly turned on instrument, um, you know, take a tear measurement, and then again, try to get in 30 minutes that same uh, insert, and you'll see a huge difference. Okay, good. I like it. Let it idle for 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Is it okay to reduce the collagen coating concentration and I mean, have you tested the minimum limit of um, of collagen concentration before? No, we have not. Um, you, uh, again, we can you can do. Uh, you know, literature will say I think uh, a very common like low value would be point zero three mix per mil, which is about you know a tenth of what we've shown here. But that that should still work. Again, any sort of excess collagen is going to be removed through the wash process. Um, point. But I think that I would recommend going below uh, 0.03 mix per mil. Okay. Now, just I guess generally speaking, do some inserts are better suited for use um, taking tier measurements than others? For example, hanging, ending, um, or you know, in, insert trade names here for a few others. Um, so I think that. The one, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Was that Brian? If, if you've only just tried the one, that's also just fine. Yeah, I think we've only just tried one. I would suspect though is that as long as that there is, uh, you know, a separation of the two of the both the apical and basal media, right? And the only thing that's separating is some type of membrane with cells, a confluence uh, sort of, uh, of cells, and as long as you know that area. Um, you should be able to, um, you know, perform uh, tier measurements. Okay. And um, let's see. To the next question, how exactly do you peel away the trans well membrane from the mono layer? Although you you said that you um, microtone them when it's still attached, correct? That's right. So just for clarification, uh, you know, when we when I cut the membrane, I'm cut, I'm kind of essentially cutting a circle at the bottom, but I'm still trying to keep the cells intact. So that this you think of it almost like a pizza pie, um, where the cells would be the cheese, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I'm cutting it from the bottom. I collect it. This is what I've done personally. Now for clarification, we've used a contractor for to generate these images, but when I did it personally, we would actually um, uh, cut it with a razor, um, and then we take this pizza pie, if you will. Again, it contains your membrane, uh, you know, with the cells on top, and we will, um, you know, parafilm embed, embed these, um, and then section uh, uh, and, and collect them for histology imaging. Um, so I, uh, I would, I would say, to how do we do it? We did it very carefully because you can imagine if it. Um, uh, if it, um, the, the cells can kind of slough off. So as we're cutting, I'd also use a pair of tweezers to kind of like um, hold everything up and just you have to do it very carefully, very slowly. And yes, it, it, it's kind of nerve wracking that you um, are, are, you know, doing this very delicate procedure on something that you've done, you know, these, these cells that you've grown for like four or five weeks. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> The cells are like the cheese. I'm going to remember that. <laughs> okay. Um, any uh, specific troubleshooting advice for cultures that are, are um, at ALI that look dysplastic, you know, with either lumps or, or holes in the epithelium, which, which affects the tear measurement, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's something – so I'll – 
I'll address the holes first. Um, typically, you'll see holes if from, from okay. The holes can come from two two things. The first is during uh, after the initial seeding. Again, we we wait about 48 to 72 hours to make sure they're fully confluent. Um, typically, in my experience, the interior area of uh, these inserts will be show full confluency, but we have to make sure that the edges are also um, confluent. Uh, so if I, you know, notice that, hey, there's still a, a few, like, empty spaces, I'll let it go for an extra day, hence the 72 hours. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that, so that will cover the whole thing during, like, the initial. Now, if you, see, if you see some holes, let's say, a week later or two weeks later, um, that's probably due to uh, maybe inappropriate handling. Let's say you're taking a tier measurement, right, a weekly tier measurement, and uh, that probe, maybe you, there was a mishandling, and one of the probes, like, scratched the surface. So typically, if there's a hole after this period, it's because there was some type of physical scraping. That's from my experience. And, yeah, that's going to definitely affect your tier measurement. So you want to make sure that, you know, you be nice and, and careful and ensure that, yes, you need to have the probe inside the, of the media, you know, on the apical side, but be sure not to scrape, um, you know, the, the cell layer because that will, you know, that will kind of ruin your experiment. Um, now, in, so hopefully that should answer your question. If you see any sort of uh, bare spots, again, it's because of probably some physical tearing, physical scratching that occurred during the ALI incubation process. Now, in regards to like the lumps that we that sometimes you'll see, um, that was something that I definitely noticed with using the stem cell media, and I actually uh, you know asked about this, uh, and that's something that's, that's normal. Though actually, kind of um, that that's usually something that you observe in the first maybe two or three weeks. Um, of, of the ALI incubation period, uh, but they will essentially, um, they'll kind of fix itself after about week four or five. And from my understanding, that happens typically with low passage level primary cells, which is exactly what you want to use. You don't want to use high passage number primary cells. Um, I don't know the reason why that's, that, that particularly happens, but I've noticed that happening with the usage of stem cell media. Okay, good, good. All right, um, we have one last question that's come in, so let's let's call this last call. Um, and I know it's been a minute since you've done um, this procedure, but um, could you walk through the protocol for collagen coding? Maybe there's um, some high points uh, or, or critical steps that you should mention. Sure. Um, so, uh, very simply, uh, we, we take, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, it should be 100 microliters of a uh, 0.3 mix per mil, or you can do 0 0.03 mix per mil, uh, and you would add it to your insert. Um, now, there's various different, um, th so the incubation period will kind of, depending upon what protocol you, know, you, uh, you, you use, some people will allow it to incubate for like an hour or two before rinsing it out and adding cells. Um, you know, we'll actually, uh, you know, other, others will put it in a refrigerator overnight, take it out, let it reach room temperature, and then perform the washing. But very simply, you know, you add your, your collagen solution, let it coat uh, the insert, um, and, you know, uh, what you could do then is you rinse it out with PBS just to remove any sort of excess uh, collagen, and then you can um, add your, uh, uh, your, your, you would seed your epithelial cells. I want to also mention one more thing, that there's another, another method that people use, Will, instead of putting it in the fridge overnight, sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, that uh, you can just leave it open overnight and let it out to completely dry out. Um, but you do need to do a, a PBS uh, rinsing, not only to remove the excess collagen, but there is like a certain type of, um, the pH is very low in the, just to keep the collagen like soluble. So you want to remove, like, uh, you use PBS not only to rinse out excess collagen, but also to remove, uh, to sort of normalize that pH. So, um, again, if you don't do that pH rinsing, the cells might become damaged from the sort of acidic environment. Okay, good, good. Um, now, two additional questions have come in, and uh, they're, they're definitely good enough for us to uh, address. Um, I think the first one, um, 
What what do you do if um, the cells don't reach confluent? If they like uh, never reach confluent. Okay, so the question then would be, do, you know, are will you see them reaching confluency in, in a you know, in let's say you're in a flask, right? Um, that's the first thing. So if you're not seeing them even you know reach confluency in a T seventy five flask then you have a problem. Now, admittedly, we don't want to have them reach full confluency. Usually when you're working with these primary cells, you want to passage them um, when they, um, you know, when they reach a confluency of around maybe 80 to 85%. You don't want them to reach full confluency because of contact inhibition will kind of affect how they operate in the future. Um, now, if you're seeing an issue where, so that, that's the first thing, right? If they're not even growing. Now, let's say you see them on the insert. One thing that's very important is to make sure that, um, that these are um, distributed like equally in the insert, right? So you, you add uh, uh, these cells. First, you want to make sure that they're not in clumps, right? So be sure before you actually add these cells, check them out after you trypsinize them, right? Uh, that they're all, they're not in clumps, they're all like individual cells because those clumps, they will cause localized growth, like higher growth areas relative to their neighbor, right? Uh, another thing is that when you do seed them, let them chill at room temperature in the hood for at least an hour, and that will allow them to settle down and, 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 and adhere to uh, the bottom of, I'm sorry, the, the, on, on, the, on that insert. So if you were to you know, seed your cells and put it right into an incubator, uh, you're going to have this, like, localized temperature differences. And so the cells, as they, you know, migrate down and settle down, they will move uh, typically into the interior areas of the insert, um, and they won't spread evenly. That's going to really mess things up. Um, so you want to make sure that, um, that these cells um, are distributed evenly on the insert, and again, if they're not growing, then there's something wrong with the cells. There could be some, you know, if they're certainly, if they're just, if they stop growing, uh, it could be the potential of contamination. That's one thing. Um, or uh, check and see the passage number, right? Maybe if it's in some case you've got like a passage 10 of primary cells. Well, yeah, they're not going to, you know, be all that uh, useful then at that point. So there's, I, I'm sorry, I hope that that uh, helps with uh, some of the troubleshooting. Yeah, no, that was pretty thorough. And and then um, one more bit of troubleshooting, that the last question that we'll take today. Um, what do you do in case there's some contraction? Right, so, you know, you seed the cells on top of the collagen and then the cells contract. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I've I've never really experienced that. Um, you know, I, I made sure, I guess, like, uh, it, it could be the case that when you have, um, when you have uh, this situation where before ALI you have, you know, your basal media, you have your insert, you have your cell, and then you have your apical media, right? So we're going from the bottom to the top. That is a lot of things to look at through a microscope, right? So it can be very difficult to visualize. Um, I would recommend that you would have a blank insert under the same conditions, apical media, basal media, and you can see, like, can, you know, see what an insert looks like without cells. Um, because if you, if you weren't used to that, you would actually might think that might have cells because those pores, right? They kind of look like little dots. Um, so it's good to kind of contrast what, you know, um, an insert with cells look like versus without cells. And, you know, again, one of the very common things that I've noticed is that you say contraction, the way I'm thinking is that are you just seeing bare spots on the outer edges of that insert, which could be due to maybe incomplete confluency, right? So it's hard to visualize the edge part of those inserts. Um, but again, using that reference as a blank, right, you can kind of go back and forth on that same plate. Okay, is this, are, are, is this area, is this edge, are they full of cells or are they not? Um, and by doing that, you know, you, you can say, okay, this needs to go an extra day. And feel free to replace that media. If it goes more than 48 hours, you know, if, you, if it takes three days for that to reach full confluency, please feel free, I, I would argue, please do, replace both the apical and basal media with growth media. 
right, to help induce them to go just, just to double that one more time to, to, to reach that full confluency, right, because you want that entire insert to be covered um, in cells because that will enable you to have an actual tight junction. Um, and so you do that, and, and, and in my experience, I've never seen like a contraction of cells. It could just be maybe that, you know, I, I don't want to accuse anybody, but it could be, right, playing devil's advocate, it could be that there wasn't a true confluency, especially at the edges. All right. Well, um, thank you. At this time, we'll conclude our Q&A session. Um, I'd like to thank Kevin for the excellent presentation and, and as always, doing a, a, such a great job of fielding everyone's questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. And um, be sure to join us for more exciting and informative uh, webinars and presentations. So uh, coming up on March 30th, uh, Kevin will be joining us again uh, to present his talk on contrasting the toxicological responses of differentiated and undifferentiated primary airway epithelial cells. That's uh, essentially part two of this talk. And then um, hopefully uh, some, we'll see some of you at the um, Society of Toxicology and Tox Expo this year. Um, we will have a booth and um, we're also giving an exhibitor hosted session. Um, so, me, uh, Dr. Sujoy Lahiri, and Dr. Carolina Lucchesi will uh, present our talk on primary and H. immortalized cells, physiologically relevant cell models for toxicological assays. That's going to be on March 21st uh, in the Music, Cent Music City Center Room 101D from 10:30 um, a.m. to 11:30 a.m. Hope to see you there. Uh, Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.